Hey, fellas. Look here. Stand by. One for C-Lab, two for Draw Eagle, three for Wolverine to round out the trio in this episode. Everybody dies. Broadcasting live from inside the power band. This is The Blah. In this episode, everybody dies. I'm your host, The Wolverine. And with me, as always, is Ben Higo. Hey. Uh, welcome to the show, folks. This week, we're talking about the 1985 sci-fi cult classic, Enemy Mine, starring Dennis Quaid and Louis Gossett Jr., uh, it's a two for this week. Uh, it's a two as Chad is uh, off gallivanting around in the woods with devil sticks. <laughs> so it's just me and Benny. Let's get into it, man. High level. What's up? Yeah. Yeah. Pull out your toothbrush. Yeah, pull out your toothbrush. Time for a two for. <laughs> oh, my God. That's so stupid. I love it. Uh, <laughs> all right. That was terrible. I'm dead. Okay. Indeed. Okay. Uh, I think I probably watched this like a hundred times when I was a kid. Um, uh, definite Hey Beast Master kind of thing. Uh, I think it was probably in heavy rotation on HBO, and I think I probably recorded it onto uh, sexy, sexy VHS at one point. Nice. And uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I uh, on this last watching, I recalled like hoping for this sort of high action, you know, Star Warsy kind of thing. And it turned out to not be that, but I still enjoyed it as a kid, you know, like, I mean, I'm, I'm saying as a kid, when I first watched it, I was expecting I got you, yeah. Action. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, just clarifying. And, uh, but I, but I still liked it because it's like, uh, I don't know. It's, you know, it's that, as we've talked about before, that sort of, uh, a real science fiction story where it's, you know, telling something like a very human story in a sci-fi setting. The pop, possibly the most human of yes. the stories. Of sci-fi. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, you know, what can I say? Uh, excellent makeup effects. Louis Gossett uh, Jr. just fucking steals the show totally. here. Like, the guy's fucking incredible. Yes. So good. So good. Uh, you know, but but Dennis Quaid, no slouch. Little, little Brian, Brian James, actually. Yes, Brian, dude. Totally. Brian James, who we love. Love him. Friend of the show. Brian James. Rest in peace. Yes. Yeah, uh, I guess I'll leave it there. All right, I could I could leave it at a simple two word. Still awesome, and I think I mm-hmm. think I will. Mm-hmm. It's still awesome. Let's jump in. Let's dive in and and unpack okay. this baby. Okay. Uh, I this movie is so good. It's still so good, man. I mean. Yeah, there's, you know, some cheesy sets or dated looking sets, like whatever, man. But it's really the story and the performances that just freaking bring this thing home. And it's so damn good. This is so not what I thought it was going to be when I was a kid. But yeah, it's it's even better than what I thought it was going to be. I was I was like you, like thinking like a pew pew freaking Star Wars situation, man. Totally. Not, not even close. A psychodrama about you know i mean it's a pretty simple concept you know like hey you're yeah. this i'm that let's like learn how to love each other you know and it's like it's great man yeah i think it i think it challenged me to appreciate a different kind of movie when i was definitely kid, you know and i'm glad it did and i'm glad it succeeded in challenging me and to like a different kind of movie because i mm-hmm. loved this movie and i remember seeing it catching it like i don't know maybe 10 or 15 years ago and i was just like god this is so damn good yeah, I think I've watched this maybe, uh, I know I've seen it since I was a kid, uh, probably a couple times, but I think the most recent time might have been like maybe, I don't know, somewhere around five years ago. It was like a hundred viewings in that like couple of year time frame when you were younger and then like two or three in the last 25 and then, years. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right? yeah, totally. Yeah. Yeah, I might have been, uh, you know, in in uh, making lists of movies for this show uh, that uh, it came up, and I was like, "Oh, I gotta watch that, man! I haven't seen that in so yeah, long." Yeah, I know. No, I haven't seen this in a while, and I still was just like, it just. I remembered every everything I remembered. I, it was just the way I remembered it. I was like, "This is great." No doubt. 
Uh, good. I'm glad you do. <laughs> I'm glad you are glad that it's good. I'm glad of that as well. It's just, yeah, great. Great. Good. Super. Good. Good. Awesome. All right. Uh, I mean, it, okay. That's, that's pretty yeah, good. Yeah, right? that's a good show. All right, folks, thank you so pretty much good. for joining us, and we'll see you next week. Next week for what are we watching? I don't know. Chad's not here to tell us. Oh shit! Yeah, I know, right? Oh, that means we can just pick whatever. That's we want. right. Although you know, Chad might have some grand scheme. He may. We should pick something that he. Well, it's too bad. Yep, too bad you're not here. You can't uh, pick. Too We're bad. gonna pick something that you hate now. <laughs> like Badger Glamp and Buddy. We're gonna do um, uh, Rings of Power because I'm certain that that'll make you uh, seethe with anger. Ooh. Right? Ooh. Yeah. And we're going to talk about how great it is. Yes. Yes. Right? No matter what. No matter what you actually think, we're going to talk about how great right. it is. Just to <laughs> irritate you. Uh, so just some stats about this movie. $29 million budget. It only made $12 million, which is uh, mm. not surprising considering when it came out and what it was up against. Uh, Wolfgang Peterson directed it. This is actually based on a novella, which I think is cool, man. And I'm not really surprised. That's why... I think the story is so good, you know, um, similar to like, you know, Blade Runner, which is based on a novella or um, I can't think of a good Stephen King one, but, you know, there's a bunch of them out there. So, yes. And Wolfgang Peterson, who I believe was coming directly off of Never Ending Story. Is that right? Yeah. Oh, snap. That's Look correct. at that. Like literally the next year he did this. Yes. Yeah. Very next film. Uh, so. There's some uh, there's some common DNA there, I think. Uh, yeah, definitely, man. Although the never ending story, I don't know. I feel like that fared a little bit better than this movie. Oh, definitely, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. But as far as like rewatchable shit that I, you know, uh, yeah, just devoured constantly yeah. as a kid while I was playing with Legos and shit. They they both were on sort of equal form, yeah you know? i would have to agree with you i think uh they're both cool stories man and they're both kind of um i don't know if rich with lore is the great is a good word but they're rich in detail they're full they're fleshed out you know what i mean so yeah you know there's even even looking back on those like 35 years later or whatever you know you still like think fondly of it and when you watch it you're like yeah right exactly <laughs> this is good man because it it was good to begin with Definitely, yeah. And they're both sort of like, you know, the window dressing might be like kid stuff, but there's some like deeper shit going on in both of those stories as far as, like, you know. Totally. What's happening. You Absolutely. Know? <clears throat> yeah. Uh, which, again, essence of great science fiction. Or fantasy. Or, or fantasy, yeah, you're right. So, yes. What else? Uh, what do you? How do you want to do this? Do you want to just kind of dig through the cast and i mean there's only two people in the story three um there's <laughs> all right so uh i'll be uh i'll, I'll be dobbage and you'll be jerry <laughs> we'll just uh no i didn't know if i had uh in, like derailed your salvo of uh stuff about the movie no 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 that was it i just wanted to throw out a couple of little the wolf king peterson yeah thing. tidbits and the and the budget thing too i'm i'm not i i'm not surprised that this movie didn't make any money. I mean, coming out in 1985, and I think, what, Empire came out in, what, 81? 83? No. Uh, 83, I think? 82? So Jedi would have come out around this time? Sometime between, yeah, 80 and 84. <laughs> Fair enough. That's a good, that's a good vague. Uh, <laughs> that's your best vague guess ever, dude. That's my best vague guess, yeah. So, yeah, some tough competition around that. You know, RoboCop comes out a couple of years later. You know, we got Terminator in this time frame. We've got, like, all these other things. You know what I mean? So this movie coming out, and it's just like a, hey, you're different than me, but we can learn to get along, you know? I mean, it, it was great mm -hmm. and poignant because there was a ton of that going on in this country, you know, certainly between blacks and whites. Um, but I don't really think anybody wanted to see that in sci-fi form no i think everybody was uh pew, 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 looking pew. for the 
high adventure thing like I was as a kid. High but, adventure. So, you know, although I think a lot of people, a lot of, <laughs> a lot of people don't notice. But, uh, <laughs> no, I think a lot of people came around to this movie once they like settled, sat down in front of it and saw it. Yeah. Um, but, you know, to, to, to get into a theater to see it was not necessarily, I don't know. No. What do I know about what drives people to see movies? Anyways. Well, I mean, the numbers speak volumes, man. It made back barely half of what they spent on it, man. I'm surprised it had a $29 million budget, you know, but it made $12 million. So clearly people were not going to see it in the theater. But I am glad that it has attained cult status in years. Yeah, the, the scuttlebutt Hence. was that uh, I think it started with like a $16 million budget. Okay. And... Uh, they ended up switching directors. Like the, they got like the dailies back, and like oh, they were man. not digging it. They ended up switching directors and deciding to dump a bunch more money into it because they already had uh, Louis Gossett and uh, Dennis Quaid on board, and okay. they would have had to pay them a buttload to get out of their contracts mm-hmm. or to you know yeah. if they didn't go through with the movie. Of course. So they just decided fuck it and went forward. Right. Got a new director and dumped a bunch more money into it, and this is what we got. So. That that only compounds what you're talking about. Yeah, <laughs> as far as like losing out, that's quite a scuttlebutt. Yeah, at the box office. Um. Wow. Okay, that's uh, interesting. Well, you know, the studios know best. Yeah. Well, I'm glad they did. You yeah. know, it's uh, sad that they lost money, but they I'm sure they probably got it back over the years. It took 35 years, but we got every cent of that fucker. 35 back. years. They they finally made some money. That's right. I'm sure. That is right. Um, uh, let's Hell, they just got another, you know, five bucks from me or whatever. The last time I watched well, it. Uh, yeah, I got, I, I <laughs> contributed my three ninety nine this week. <laughs> uh-huh. Yeah. So, what do you want to talk about first? Hmm. The, well, first I want to just, t- I want to talk about the runtime of the movie. So I remember this movie being crazy long, but it's not, it's 108 minutes. So it gives you that like you know, hour 45 mark, which I, I feel is kind of a magical, not short enough to be too short, but not so long to be, you know, like you need to get up and walk around. You know what I mean? So I like the, yeah. I like the length of the movie and I think that it, it lends itself well to the story. They're able to tell an effective story and all of the bits that they chose to, to adapt from the story, I think were the right ones because it, it flows nicely, you know. Uh huh. Have you have you read the story by any chance? No, or? I have not read the story. In fact, I didn't even okay. know it was a novella until I started doing some reading on it. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't actually realize that until I was sort of doing some research after this one. Right. Yeah. I think it was a. Um, it was a. a it was a solid um, uh, runtime on the movie in terms of telling the story and making all the elements fit together and and telling it effectively and not leaving critical parts on the floor. You know what I mean? So um, I thought that was worth mentioning. Yeah, definitely. I, I think the pacing is pretty good. I feel like they spend enough time pretty much on all of right? it. The end feels a little like, uh, all right, let's wrap it up. Right, you know? doesn't it? Um, you know, a, a little rushed perhaps. Yeah. But um, but at the same time, it, it kind of works. It does. Because the rest of the movie is just like, Really takes his time with everything. Yeah, but so. because what are you going to do at the end? I mean, are you going to have him go to Drac and like, or Drax and you know, right. have some whole other scene, you know, where it's like everybody's cheering and, you know, it's just kind of stupid. It was, I, I, yeah, I, I mean, right? it, it might have been interesting to see that part of the story, like him trying to bring Zamas to Drax and, you know, like whatever. You know, right. whatever happened there, mm-hmm. like, I'm sure it wasn't a perfectly smooth sailing kind of situation, like with a human joke to, you know, sing in this new drac. Yeah. I think, I don't know. I, I, I think movies of that time did that a lot. That it was yeah. kind of like, and then this happened. Right. And, that's the, <laughs> and everything you know, was okay. <laughs> and everything was okay. Yeah. You know? Everything's okay. <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> I, I I think it's only with like modern eyes that something like that would even bother me. Yeah, right. <laughs> but it kind of it kind of has like the stink of like the Cameron principle on it, you know. Like, well, if we're gonna cut anything, let's mm-hmm. cut this entire thread out. You know what I mean? Like, it's right. similar to that because right. it's like if you opened up the 
the gates of like, let's go to the alien world. It's like, okay, now we got to have sets and let's like, how do we begin it? How do we end it? You know, like now it's a whole yeah. nother thing and probably another 30 minutes of the movie. You know what I mean? Which is quite a lot of money. Sure. And out. you know, you gotta have more, more actors and like crazy track makeup. Yeah, and, totally. You, gotta, you know, more sets and more, you know, yeah, I get it. Yeah, that's it, man. So it was financial. Yeah, it was financial, but you know, it was kind of, so it was good that they left it where it was. Although it was kind of funny at the same time, you know, cause it was like, it was just, <laughs> it's like a painting <laughs> of the star field and the Drac planet. <laughs> it's like, and then Darwich took him to the planet and everything right. was great. <laughs> and everything was just like this like super wide, far Dun- away shot Dun- of him. Dun- like, you know, and you can kind of hear some <laughs> singing going on, you know, like that. <laughs> right. And then it's just... and the name of Willis Davidge was sung into the you know drac fucking into the lineage song or whatever, in the yeah. halls <laughs> of the dracs. Will yeah. Darwich's name was added. It's definitely kind of jank, but oddly also. Quite satisfying. Yeah, it was, man. It was <laughs> one of those rare instances where it's both at the same time. Th- both at the same time, man. Yeah, yeah. So kudos to that. Uh, I, I like going uh, directly to the end. Yeah, of the movie. Yeah, it's a great place to start. <laughs> it's a good place to start. I think you know, and you gotta like work your way back from there. Yeah, I think. Um. So so to go. So the next thing I, I would say that I want to talk about was the uh, world building because I had a thought when I was watching this. Now, you know, obviously this is not what I thought when I watched it as a kid, you know, as a kid, I just kind of took it at face value and I was like, yeah, these these ships are pretty cool. And like the, you know, ship battle Mm -hmm. scenes were, were definitely cool. And uh, technology, at the time I was like, oh, that's really cool. Even though now I was kind of like, you know, interesting choices. But what what I do dig about this is that it has this vibe of like, you know, because at the very beginning narration, he says, oh, in early 21st century, which would be really kind of now-ish, you know, uh, maybe mm-hmm. maybe 10 or 20 years into the future from, from where we are right now in 2023. But, you know, that's how he starts off, you know, the narration and kind of like giving the, the backdrop of the story. But, you know, the movie yeah. looks like, uh, if we were just a little further ahead in time, you know what I mean? Like there's no crazy teleporters. There's no hyperdrive. There's no warp drive. There's no none of that shit. You know what I mean? Like the Right. Yeah. The, the spacesuit looks like a spacesuit. Exactly. It looks like a kind of like a fighter jet. Yeah, the, dude. And the the, ridiculously tiny little gun that he has looks like a ridiculously tiny little gun. It was a ridiculous. Yeah. That, that was <laughs> that was a very ridiculous <laughs> tiny little gun, dude. But like even the space station Ben looked like uh you know, it was it was using centrifuge to to generate the gravity. You right. know what I mean? Like that yeah. kind of thing. So I immediately like I had obviously never thought of thought of that before. And I immediately was like, wow, this is cool, man, because I kind of dig that. We don't get a ton of stories that are taking place like, you know, um, like a week into the future. You know what I mean? As it were. Sure. You know, everything's always like this far flung galaxy far away, you know, 25th century shit. Right. So I don't know. I'm just saying I dug it. (laughs) I I like that. Yeah, it's 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 interesting because now that we've talked about it, like it makes sense. But. I feel like if we were going to do the same thing now, we would make it look way more NASA-ish, you know, like the the ships wouldn't be so streamlined and, you know, like things would be wrapped in like gold foil and there'd be like solar collectors on everything. Mm. And like, you know, like Mm -hmm. I feel like that's how we would do it if we're going to do it now. But at the same time, it sort of makes sense what they did Yeah, for that time frame. So, yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. But Um, yeah, go ahead. No, no, no. Go ahead. I didn't have it. Uh, uh, okay. Well, I don't want to. I don't want to like switch gears out of the world building thing too much. Mm. But just talking about the special effects, etc. I was a little like, eh, you know, but all right, I guess. You know, it's no, it's no ILM. It doesn't look like a Star <laughs> Wars movie. And 
go figure. It was fucking ILM that did this movie. So. Are you serious? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Apparently so. Yeah. Oh, that's, wow. uh, at least uh, one source said that. So, Oops. Um, yeah. Yeah. Like, oh, maybe Lucas was like, yeah, I'll give you guys a little extra on my movie if you don't quite make it so nice for the other films. <laughs> <laughs> not that they were not that they were terrible, you know, right. but I was just like, I just like uh, Chrissy Snaps and I were talking about it and she was like, it looks pretty good. And I was like, yeah, it does until you like consider like what Empire Strikes Back looked like, you know, yeah, right. Like, that was like incredible. You know, this is like, OK, but that was like incredible. So, yeah, no, you're right about that, man. Um, hmm. I, I, I never uh I knew that I'm actually looking that up right now to see if I can find it. I want to see if if that's true or not. Or I'm pretty sure it is. I'm sure you're right. I just wanted to see like if there was a mention of it at all. Um, at any rate, uh, yeah, it's kind of weird, man. <laughs> I thought that was really funny when you started that comment, and um, very surprised that it's ILM. I mean, you know, you got to work with what you've got. I don't know how much Lucas spent on Star Wars or Empire Strikes Back, but, you know, he was already swimming in gads of cash, you know, from the people forking over the money to go see the movie and the bloody toys and the whole, the whole, uh, the whole nine, you know what I mean? So it's a bit different, you know, when you're coming to the table with 29 million and you're like, make me a Star Wars, <laughs> make me a Star Wars, dude. It's like, you know, yeah. I, I know that I did read a blurb that, that they went um, on location somewhere to, to film this. Uh, I don't remember where that was, but, you know, it had this kind of volcanic -y kind of look to it. You know what I mean? And I, I, I feel like, you know, it's pretty good. I mean, it's definitely stinks of sets, you know, at times. Like, they didn't have enough dressing to cover up the fact that they were working on sets, but... You know, it still worked. I, I kept finding myself, you know, as I always have with this movie, like just so completely glued to the actors and what they're doing in every scene uh, that I, I, I'm i like, I know that, it, that the sets look kind of cheesy, but I'm just like, yeah, whatever. You know what I mean? Yeah, the, the initial salvo of filming, I believe, was done on Iceland. That's it. And they didn't like, like, the the new director didn't like it so they did most of it with sets and then there was another location i'm not sure where i don't remember exactly where that they did for some of the other for some of the more wide shots and like what you were talking about but um okay well there you go well, there you go i don't know there's something charming about the set you know Same. like i agree um there's something about it that works and i almost feel like that's why we've gone back to doing that with like the volume and you know all of that technology like there's it's obviously world's better now but yeah. you know it's like a it's like a live matte painting essentially yeah <laughs> um it is but there's there's something about just having complete control over the light and you know all that stuff definitely that that really works and not having for film. yeah and not not having everything on a fucking green screen man you know right having it even though it's fake, having it actually there in some respect is definitely better than like standing in front of a green screen. Right? I, no question. I think so, man. For sure. Practical sets are great. I was super impressed when I heard that in Riddick they use practical sets like for crematoria and like all these different things. You know what I mean? Yeah. You know, like I was actually pretty blown away by that because I, I, at the time, I, I could, I mean, I think they got a lot of cash for that movie because it was Vin Diesel and he was like, super red white hot you know at the time like fast and the yep. furious all this kind of thing um obviously chronicles of riddick is the sort of instantaneous cult classic it did not do as well but uh yeah those were all sets man like that, that was pretty damn cool too man that crematoria set was great and a great example of a well done set you know what i mean like the i'm sure like the close-up stuff that like as like like when they were climbing and like when they were like scrabbling across the surface, yeah. like trying to uh, beat out the <laughs> you know on fire planet thing. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I'm sure like all the fire and stuff was probably 
digital. No, but. no, I'm sure it was. But like, yeah, that's that's what I was talking about. The screen, you know, the running over the surface and all that kind of thing, man. The steam. Yeah, right. And, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, now that I'm thinking about it, like that would have to be like something they made. I don't can't think of any like right? place you could location you could film something like that. Exactly. Not even anywhere volcanic would look like that. So yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I like I like sets, you know, like I'm I like the old school, like, you know, like old uh original Star Trek, et cetera. I like there's a lot of like sets, you know. <laughs> well, yeah, man. Analog dude. And and this is what yeah. this is what a lot of filmmakers are going back to now. You know, it's like we Yeah, definitely. We we started the CGI started with Tron, really. You know what I mean? And then like Willow was another one where it was first used, you know, and then now we've mm-hmm. we've had you know, literally decades of it and computer power and so forth and so on. And it's like last starfighter. Yeah. Last starfighter. Thank you. And there's, there's all these whole films have been made with CGI, but it's just like, there's nothing better than like actual film and actual sets, you know, analog stuff. And, uh, I think, I mean, everything has its place of course, but, uh, it's good to see people, you know, embracing that man. So yeah, I agree with that sentiments, dude. Definitely. You know, there's nothing like a good set, you know, and even this sort of like B minus set or B plus set as it were, you know, with the giant kind of weird, you know, kind of, I don't know, like they look like kind of like pillars, but you could tell that they were sort of like Right. Old trees or something, man, you know, mm-hmm. uh, all of those things. And then just, you know, it does convey a, a sense of just a very harsh, hard uh, landscape, man. Like it's all rock and hard surfaces and shit. You know what I mean? So it, it definitely did for me. What do you think? Absolutely. Right. No, it's funny. It, uh, everything is like... I don't know. I think it's like a hybrid is the best thing at this point, you know, like some digital, yeah. but like what you can actually do on camera mm. is, is golden, you know, mm. and you see that a lot with the return of a lot of practical effects and uh, sets in terms of things like the volume. And I don't know. It's mm. uh, we're at a good place now. We're getting back some stuff that was quite charming. And like, when you go back and watch a movie like this, there's something visceral, like you said, about those sets. Like it's very hard and, you know, right. they're like trying to scrabble together and survive in this place that's pretty inhospitable. Right. But I think too, just kind of building and building here, like you're, there, there is a difference now, now that I'm like really thinking about it. Like there is a discernible difference between a CGI green screen set where the landscape is added in in post yeah. via computer and an actual, even though it's a set, it's essentially a stage, you know, an actual environment, yeah. you know, you're creating like physical, even though they're fake, it's like physical fake rocks and fake trees and fake this and that and the other thing, you know what I mean? It's like, and so because it's actually real, you're going to get a different quality of performance from the actors playing on said stage. So, yes, you know, there's, and, and I can tell the difference, you know, I think you can tell the difference. Yeah, no doubt. An actor that's standing on a stage that looks like the place they're supposed to be in is lit like the place they're supposed to be in. Right. And they're actually talking to like a puppet instead of right. like, you know, standing in front of a green screen, talking to a fucking tennis ball. Like, yeah. you know, you're, you're, uh, uh I mean, if I was an actor, I would I would definitely be a hell of a lot happier standing there in costume, feeling like I'm actually in the place, right? As opposed to you know having to just like make it all up whole cloth. Yeah, hundred percent, man. Yeah, uh, and interesting. And it's going to deliver a different kind of performance. I mean, you got to use more imagination when you're working with a green screen. I mean, I guess it's not like I've ever done it, but I would think it's, it's got to be all your imagination. Right? Yeah, like you got to. You picture the whole thing and different and you know to a degree more difficult you know yeah so absolutely yeah that's uh absolutely. that's a good point i'm glad you brought that up yeah i i do I, i'm kind of appreciating the sets more now it's like you can kind of i don't know it's like when you're watching it you're kind of like oh yeah it's kind of phony you know what i mean but I, but i don't really care you know because the movie's so good <clears throat> but at the same time now i'm getting even more of an appreciation for it you know and it definitely did convey, as I said a minute ago, like that harshness of that very rocky environment, you know? There's something about the phoniness of it that just has 
charm. That you know? too. Like, I'm thinking about, you know, like, uh, like Forbidden Planet, you know, like there's a lot of like phony sets in that movie, but there's just something really charming about that. Right. You know, just like phony rocks and right. foreground shit with like matte paintings in the background. Yeah. You know? <laughs> but I like the when it's lit up right, right and you got the actors there and everything is like put together, right. like just something kind of magical about right. that. Right. And if all you know. all those component pieces are good, it's like even like when we watch Forbidden Planet, like I was like, yeah, this is freaking great, man. You know, it's like, yeah, sure, all the stuff and the technology and whatever is outdated, you know, but it's like it, it it was still enjoyable to watch. And the movie still had value and told a great story. You know what I mean? Even with the uh, everything being as, you know, sort of lower budget and dated as it was. Mm -hmm. What do you think? Agree? Yeah, agree. Yeah. I mean, in, in that case, it was, you know, State of the art. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. At the time it was, yeah. State, state of in the, the art. In the, in the case of Enemy Mine, it was, you know. Maybe not state of the art. <laughs> not state of the art, but it was like, you know, a, a transitional time, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. So. But it still, it still worked great, man. So, you know, um, all very good. You know, the factory was. Yes. The factory was really the only other set, man. You know, that and the sort of. We we don't really get a whole lot of sets in this movie. It's like mainly like the planet sets, right? And then you got the factory, and then you got um, inside of the space yeah, station. In, yes, thank you. Inside the space station, it's like that. That's really it. You know what I mean? So, that's pretty much it. Yeah, it, it kept it super minimal, and that's good. Put all the money in the outside sets because that was what was key. You know, and well, that's also where the meat and potatoes of the story takes place. <laughs> yeah. Indeed, of the slugs, as it were. <laughs> Space slugs. <laughs> the, the slugs and uh, green blobs of... <laughs> oh, those, what are those green, those green orbs? Food, food orbs or whatever the they drag are. The yeah. food orbs, dude. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> drag, <laughs> drag food orbs for the win, man. Yeah, and fucking space turtles or whatever those things were. Uh, yeah. What the hell were those, man? Kind of, sort of, uh... They had, like, prehensile, like, trunks, sort of, right? but they were, like, they had the shell and... Yeah. Sort of, sort of like a horseshoe crab combined with a turtle, maybe. Yeah. Right? Yeah. You know, something like that. Wacky creatures. Well, wacky indeed, but they got a lot of mileage out of those creatures, man. They were able to use them for shelter and, you know... No, they ended up being like Eat and the, uh, yeah, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Everything. It's like all right, it's food, it's shelter, it's, it's everything. Everything, yeah. Start wearing these uh, on her back soon, like this little hobbit. I'm kind of surprised right? they didn't make like you know helmets and armor out of it, just in case they got caught. You know, in the meteor shower while they were like out in the midst of shit, they didn't get caught in a fucking meteor shower. That would have been kind of <laughs> tight, but how would they have? They didn't really have anything you know, like implements for like cutting or you know sh sort of uh fashioning no they didn't have shit no they literally didn't have shit they had the escape pod and you know the the uh they had what they brought with them. yeah exactly <laughs> but which wasn't much because his ship exploded i was going to say what were the names of did they say what the names of those ships were were they did they have some sort of like classification like I, x wing fighter or, you know what i mean like something similar to that i don't recall i don't know which means it probably wasn't one. I don't, I don't think they made a big deal about any of that stuff. But that see, kinda... again, that's what's great about this movie. Yeah. Is they were not focusing on, you know, I mean, they, you know, Lucas kind of does the same thing in Star Wars. He's, you know, focused on the story. But the story in Star Wars is arguably just, you know, it's really just a kind of rehashing of like the Save the Princess story. You know, there's really nothing that sure. cool there, you know, and all of the... The droids and the and all that stuff, the ships and whatnot, are all the backdrop, you know. Which I think doing it that way is what made it so damn intriguing, you know, when you were younger. Um, and th yes. and this one, the story is infinitely better, you know what I mean. And they uh, do sort of the same thing of just kind of like you know, all that stuff is just necessary to the backdrop of telling the story, like the ships and whatnot. So they're not you know taking time to go. Well, this is the X two three four. You know, it's got mm. uh, five thrusters on the back and uh, it'll go to uh you know it goes about 50 miles an hour <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, that, like, that mean by that i mean 50 space miles an hour 
Yeah. Uh, you know, um, watching it, I was like, oh, it'd be interesting to see more in this universe, you know? Yes, and dude. Have that kind of stuff fleshed out a little more. Um, you know, speaking of world building, mm. you know, I was like, oh, this would, this would be interesting to see like a, a, a spinoff of, or, you know, something that like a different story, but yes. told in the same universe. Or, or if you were to take this movie and then say, instead of doing a remake, uh, or, 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 you, you do a remake, but you like expand it. You know what I mean? So instead right. of doing a film, you do like, you know, a mini series, right? So you've got right. more time to tell more story, but you can also do more world building, but it would be sweet to keep the same aesthetic that they had just maybe updated a little teeny bit. You know what I mean? But no, do 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 the same kind of a thing, but with the modern techniques we have, you know. Yeah, and then you could spend some time on. You could tell the story of Jerry and Davidge, but like, you know, you could go back to like obviously people were like worried about them and didn't know what had happened on both sides, right? right? So like, you go back to the Drax, like you know, trying to figure out what happened to Jerry, and totally you go back to you know the crew trying to figure out what happened to uh, Davidge, and yeah, you know those those kind of interstitial things like would be interesting to flesh that world out a little more i totally in this agree. story obviously like it's not the focus at all they're just like they're here to tell the story of these two and everything else is just like window dressing but yeah indeed indeed i agree with you 100 percent. Hmm. that would be a cool way to do it and i i really kind of i dig the idea of having you know it's kind of keeping the aesthetic that they have but using like you said modern techniques to do it you know what i mean that would be uh you could have something very gold there, man. Very gold, right? The practical makeup still holds up. Definitely, man. They could do exactly the same thing, and it would be awesome. Well, they clearly put the money in the right place, man, because, you know, putting making making sure that the makeup on the actor was perfect was the way to go, because it was perfect. It still looks incredible even today uh, with all the little, you know, the various different bubbles uh membranes on the head like mm. on the yeah. you know next to the sort of the chin and then you know on the sides of the mm -hmm. like the temples and then in the back as well man i was like wow just so excellent man it's craftsmanship yeah absolutely they sort of pulse and move and but it's also a very expressive makeup set yeah you know um like the the performance really came through 100 percent. you know uh, and then and then put, you know, a guy, uh, a pilot like Lou Gossett Jr. inside that suit, man. And, you know, you got a uh, you got a guaranteed freaking great performance, man. Yeah. You know, speaking of Louis Gossett Jr. Speaking of perfect segue setup. Go ahead. Eh, Try. No, that was perfect. No, I just I, I think uh, I think Louis Gossett Jr. deserves like a section here uh, definitely at some point or another and i think now is as good a time as any yeah as we're just kind of rambling all over the place and having a good time of it i suppose the performance here is just like superlative it's, it's just crazy man like like right from the get-go like they, they crash and like he's like on the planet and he like strips down and he like jumps into the pool and he's just like doing all these weird like body movements and like uh -huh. you know like when he's like drinking and like eating, he's doing this stuff like with his like mouth and his throat. Mm. Like he's like, like he'd clearly been watching like wildlife and like different things, like trying to like parse together this like performance, like physical performance, you know, like yes. all this physicality, which was just like super cool. And, you know, then he's just, you know, then, then he's like normal Jerry as he's like getting to know Davidge. And then like when, when Zomis comes, like he, becomes all motherly and like you know he's like knitting and he's like singing and you know <laughs> like he just becomes very like sort of feminine and i don't know like he just goes through like all these different things in this particular performance and it's just like it's amazing no it is it's kind of um hard to collect the words to describe it dude because you're right there's uh yeah, i'm rambling but well, you know, maybe a it's ramble worthy yeah maybe a little bit yeah and it is <laughs> ramble worthy and i mean i think like you know, there's a lot there. Like you just said, like, 
this movie tackles this interesting idea of, you know, a single sex organism, man, you know, which is like you're reproducing and then you're dying. Like, that's it. You're going to, that baby's coming and you're going to die. That's it. You know, like there's no, uh, but I don't, I don't know that that was how it was supposed to work. I think it was how it worked this time. You think? I think I thought so. Yeah. I thought ordinarily he would be there to like, you know, sing his own kid in. Shit. Really? Well, who else would do it? Well, I don't know. I mean, maybe they have some kind of situation going on where it's like, you know, when you give birth, you, well, no, that that's totally wrong. You're absolutely right. Cause the, the old, the older Drac in the mind proves it. Right. Proves your, your stance. You're right. You're a hundred percent right. Okay. So something goes wrong. Jerry eats a bad space slug, whatever. Yeah. You know, just malnutrition, <laughs> and, you know? Yeah. Which could definitely be fatal if you were pregnant, you know? Yeah. Everything you're eating is going to, you know, creating this little drac. Anyway, we have, however, right, however it right, went. Right, right, right. But, but the asexual thing is, is definitely an interesting, like, I don't know that I've seen that. I'm sure there was like a species like that in Star Trek somewhere, but. I'm sure. You know, as like a main character in a movie, I don't think there's any other place that's been a thing. So. No, I don't think so either, yeah. man. So I really, um. Uh, dug that whole, you know, dynamic. And it, it's a key point in the story, too, because, you know, without that, we wouldn't have the bond between, you know, this alien kid and Darwich and... Darwich. Dar- <laughs> <laughs> That's what you call a space sandwich, a Darwich, dude. So... <laughs> You, uh, you know, and, and it's just a, it's just a space slug and a hot dog bun. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> Big nasty green space slug and a hot dog just, bun. That's try the Darwich hot dog bun. That's it, untoasted. <laughs> yes. <laughs> try the Darwich today, folks. Straight from the outer rim. Mm. Yeah. So I think that you know that that set that story point to you know brings us to the end of the story with him having the bond with the kid and you know and and that's the other thing that's cool too about this movie is that you know it's not just like a oh you're my enemy but we have to survive together on the planet like let's learn to get along it's it's it takes it beyond that by saying that yeah not only that i learned your language you learned mine and like we're learning each other's customs and all of that stuff is very cool but it's like now i'm having a baby oh by the way i'm gonna die too and yeah. oh, by the way, you're going to have to raise this kid. And oh, by the way, you're going to have to drag this kid back to Drax and bring him before the council of the. And, uh, yes. you, know, <laughs> you know, sing the song of the lineage, man. Like, yeah, <laughs> that was. <laughs> that sounded very Chewbacca right there, bro. Uh, <laughs> but there's a little chewy in there. Yeah, yeah there's a, a little chewy. Bit. There's a little chewy DNA in there for sure. Yeah. You know, so that that that's where this this I, I think this, you know, takes it like way beyond you know, your sort of um, run of the mill, you know, sci-fi reflecting, you know, the human condition kind of thing, you know, because of, because of all those other tasks that he has to take care of. Oh yeah. He sudden it suddenly becomes a story about him being thrust into the position of, you know, having to take care of a little alien kid that he has no fucking idea how to take care exactly. of. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Jerry gives him absolutely no, no like, no direction whatsoever, you know, like, yeah, you'll be fine. you know, are they supposed to drink milk first or that, you know, is there a, <laughs> like, is, like, how does this work? You know? And like, it, it sort of, he just gets lucky, I guess, you know? Yeah. But yeah, it, it adds another layer of, of depth to it where, you know, like you said, besides just, uh, you know, starting as enemies and then learning to work together to survive and then becoming like true friends, you know? Um, to like being like you're you know now you're Uncle fucking Darwich man you're <laughs> yeah Uncle, Uncle Darwich <laughs> you're gonna have to teach this little Jack how to play football you know it's just uh, <laughs> he's the guy that just owns- what's gonna happen <laughs> he's the guy that owns this the sandwich stand that sells the Darwich <laughs> <laughs> Uncle Darwich. <laughs> It's Uncle Darwich himself. Uncle Darwich's old fashioned Darwiches. <laughs> old fashioned.
old-fashioned darwiches, just like Granddad used to make. <laughs> With or without extra slug gravy. Oh, wow. <laughs> mm, that's the best part. Well, while you were away, I was able to confirm that uh, ILM indeed is in the special effects credits. Okay, interesting. Along with United Effects Munich, who also did oh. the effects for Never Ending Story. Ah, interesting. Very cool. So I'm guessing maybe they were more responsible for the creatures and makeup effects, etc. Sets, baby. Yeah, I dig it. God, Never Ending Story has just like, oh, so good, man. I mean, there's a lot of sets and stuff in Never Ending Story. I don't want to like go on about no, that No, I don't again, either. But, but like but, um, sets and puppets, yeah. Sets and yeah, makeup effects and creatures and stuff. Yeah, again, more shared DNA. Hundred percent. So let's talk about. Uh, should we talk about Darwich? <laughs> Good old fashioned Darwiches. Good old fashioned Darwich, man. I mean, yeah, absolutely. That's a it dovetails nicely with like the last thing we we're talking about was. Uh, Darwich teaching Zombies how to play football. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. That's pretty good, kid. That's pretty much how it goes, although usually you don't get to eat the ball when you're done playing. Yeah, right. <laughs> that was funny. Yeah, couple, that little line. Yeah, there's a couple of funny little lines in this. I think yeah. uh, I, I like, you know, the taking on the Herculean task of raising a total alien in a total alien environment that's alien to both of you and the kid, you know, is like, uh, it's pretty crazy, man. And it's, you know, he kind of does it in a kind of, uh, I felt like it was kind of a time honored way, you know, just kind of, sure. Yeah. Doing what he did, doing what he knows, you know? And it's like, what else are you going to do? I guess you can only do what you know. Exactly. Uh, but it's good. But I, I think the key thing there or the key takeaway is, uh, you know, him forming the bond with the kid, you know, and kind of giving the kid the backstory, why we're here, we're not from here, why we look different, all that kind of thing. You know what I mean? But it forms the bond with the kid, which is what, you know, makes him defy everybody to go back and save him, which is great. Yeah. And he he wastes absolutely no time with that shit, too. It's which, like which is even better. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the he like gets out of the hospital bed and he's like, "All right, fucking out of here." I know, I know. I love how like <laughs> that wastes any fucking time. One minute he's on the gurney, dude, and they're about to they're about to just you know shoot the guy out into space in one of those giant sunglasses cases, like in Star yeah. Trek, right? <laughs> right. And then the very next so minute like, he's just like, "Oh, there's a how about ah." Uh, Wait, oh, I'm awake now. And the next thing you know, he's got a shave and a haircut, and he's like, I'm out of here. Yeah, yeah. The next thing you know, he's fucking blasting his way out of the side of the fucking station. Which was pretty sweet. Yeah, wasting no time. It was good. Uh, I'm, I'm tempted to go to the uh, to the rescue and the like the, the mine after this, but I don't want to end off uh, Darwich too soon. No, I don't. I don't know how much. I don't really know how much I have on Darwich or how much there is on Darwich. So, uh, yeah. do what you're going to do. I, will, I mean, you know, uh, fucking, you know, it's Quaid, dude. I know he's he's exactly. fucking he's amazing. You know, like, and he's great in this. It's just yeah. like he's just playing like a pretty straightforward, you know, fighter jock kind of, you know, right, all American sort of guy here yeah. which is something we've we've all seen before and like Louis Gossett Jr. is like inventing something whole cloth you know agree so it's a it's a it's two totally different things not to not to say that Dennis Quaid isn't good because I love Dennis Quaid but uh we love Dennis Quaid and his excellent work dude but this is yeah, this is very so, similar to the fighter jock inner space guy you know what I mean like I mean sure in 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 some ways you know Yes. So it's absolutely. not, it's, it's not, uh, I wouldn't say it's a total swish, but, uh, it's not quite what, what Gossett's doing either, you know? The Tuck Pendleton machine, 100%. Yes, exactly, man. <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah. So, um, I don't know. That's all I really got on Quaid, dude. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, I think, uh, you know, just to touch on the other two, real sort of main people in the movie. Like, the kid does a really good job. Uh, yeah. You know, especially wearing, like, that shit ton of makeup, dude. That whole, you know, suit, really. Um, no, a, a kid having the patience to put up with, like... That? You know, fucking, 
you know, four hours of makeup or whatever the hell it was to get into that get up. Like, right. And then be in it. And then, you know, yeah, no, it's a great performance. Um, the only weird thing, and this is like something that I read that I hadn't even considered when watching the movie was like the kid talks like Jerry talked like, like he would have learned to talk. Exactly. He would have learned to speak English from Davidge. So he would have talked like Davidge, not like Jerry. You know, like he uh, still talked yeah. like an alien who had who was speaking English with an accent. And Ooh, you know, they're like, Well, that. maybe yeah. like the and you know, it's the alien anatomy creates like a different sound and possible. But it doesn't doesn't account for like, you know, sort of you know, like No, dude, you're uh, speaking it as if yeah. it were a second language, you know. <laughs> you're a hundred percent right. Well, I'm not right. Somebody who you know, well, whatever, who, I mean, well, whatever you're, you're the one telling me. That so, yeah, that, that, that is a hundred percent right. Because, uh, wow. I never thought about that. I think it might actually even just be an IMDB like under gas or something. Maybe. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Well, well, where I read it. Crazy. Anyways, that's, that's not the kid that played Zalman's fault. That's just how they decided to do it. But sure. It's kind of silly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was. Yeah. That's a little silly, but it worked. Yeah. You know, well, I, again, I never thought about it until I read that. And I was like, oh, yeah, that's true. Yeah, I never thought about it either until you brought it up. But anyway, kudos to the kid. Great job. And then, uh, of course, we have... Uh, Bumper Robinson. What was the kid's name? Bumper Robinson. I'm not familiar. He's not a kid anymore. Well, clearly, yeah. Anyway. Uh, anyway, let's... Uh, I mean, well, we can talk about Brian James. I mean, his part is very simple, dude. Not a ton of dialogue it's, either. He's like a giant. Th- he's very. He's actually kind of like Leon in Blade Runner, dude. He's just kind of dude, right? So like Leon in Blade Runner, like he literally makes like the same face, like when he's like, you know, he's like doing that thing where his eyes kind of get all screwed up and his head tilts to the side, you know, yeah. like totally, totally Leon. Well, this was like, the year after Blade Runner, bro. Yeah. I think he well, still he yeah. still basically looks the same mm-hmm. from Blade Runner. It, he's it's basically the same character. Mm. Yeah, that's kind of weird, but not like uh, you know very different circumstances. <laughs> well, yeah, but it's it's weird too because like we love you know his rendition of the general in uh, Fifth Element. In fact, it's probably my favorite Brian James movie. Period, and it was his last movie. Yeah, you know, but like he was also in Forty Eight Hours, which came out right around this time we talked about, and you know, he was one of the cops. Totally different, totally normal. You know, Brian James, awesome performance. Uh, yeah. So yeah, just I don't know, kind of kind of odd, but it's like you know, how much can you really? I don't know what what else you really could have done with that. You know, the guy's basically a slave master. You know, I mean, it's a it's kind of a bit part. You know, yeah. the, they're and probably the like they part. probably saw him in Blade Runner and they're like, do that, yeah. dude. And he's like, all right, whatever. <laughs> you know, exactly. He's awesome, man. Yeah, he's Brian. You know, Fifth Element was great because I feel like he really kind of got to do a little more than I'd seen him do in previous roles. Yeah. Same here. But he's always been somebody that's been able to convey a lot with a little, you know. Agree. And he's just got a, 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 a sort of... Uh, Interesting and intriguing look. Yeah, yeah. And he's, you know, he's just one of those dudes who's kind of, uh, I don't know, he's like sort of can be menacing at the same time as being like vulnerable, you know. We on. Yeah. Uh, perfect. Perfect uh, example. Example, of that. yeah. Agree. Yeah. Agree. Yeah. I don't know. He's just got an interesting look, and he's got a he's got a thing, but uh, he does his thing in this. <laughs> it's it's a very Brian. James. Whatever that thing is, he's doing it and doing it, it a he's, lot. He's doing it, and we That's love him, folks. That's what you get him for. <laughs> uh, very good. Pretty impressive dogfight with the enemy ships in the beginning of the film. I really liked that. Yeah, right? again, the like. Not not bad ship stuff, not quite up to the level of Star Wars, but not bad, not bad at all. And I thought the ja- the I I thought the uh, Drac ship design was interesting and cool. It kind of had an asymmetry to it that was uh, not present in the uh, sort of the human counterpart. Yeah, whatever BSA or BAF or whatever it was. Yeah, ships. 
So yeah, it's interesting, right? It, it's sort of I don't know why, but it sort of reminded me of like a Cylon Raider a little bit too. I guess this definitely had a little Cylon Raider going on, dude. Right yeah, out. I mean, not really, but for some reason, it just reminded me of it. No, definitely, dude. It had that kind of like flying wing shape, you know? Hmm. Yeah. So yeah, no, you're right on there. Uh, yeah. What do you got? <laughs> Darwich you're making a conscience. Uh, Effort to call him Darwich. Yep. Even though it's Davidge. <laughs> Darwich now, baby. When, when he builds their initial shelter and you know, it's like <laughs> clearly they're like they're they're beginning to bond and form a, a like a relationship and learning how to talk to each other. And yeah. Like, <laughs> and just uh, you know, uh, fucking Jerry being like it's shit. <laughs> <laughs> he goes and kicks it and the fucking whole thing falls over. I don't know. It's just, you know, good old school sort funny, of slapsticky man. comedy moment. No, it was good. It was really and, funny. And great delivery from both of the actors there. Yeah, agree. Yeah. yeah it was good. It's such a pile of shit. And when it collapsed, it was just a pile of shit. It was great, man. <laughs> you know? <laughs> And it's just like how he runs over and just like sort of just gives it a gentle little kick. He's like, yeah, see, it's yeah. great. <laughs> it falls over. And I love how he's champion, championing the, you know. It's tropey as hell. I'm doing but... something. I'm building something. Yeah, yeah. What are you <laughs> exactly. doing? Nothing. Yeah. Again, tropey as hell, but, but well done. Great job. Great effort. Thank you. Thank you for the great effort. Uh, yes. I don't know what else I got. What else? Oh, the uh, the creature in the ground was, uh, mm. you know, like kind of like a it, when it came, poked its head up, it was kind of like it looked like a Chinese dragon. You know what I mean? But um, in yeah, when it's just doing unexpected, like, yeah, when it's just doing like you know tentacle form, you know, very uh, sarlacc, which you know is kind of interesting. There was some Sarlacc going on there. <laughs> there were some Sarlacc elements going on there. That whole scene when when uh, Darwich falls into the pit and the thing wraps around his leg, like, they dragged that out for so long. Man. They kind of did. <laughs> it's so funny. It's like right? it's like the same like three shots. It's like they go from like the the thing wrapped around his leg and it's all bloody, and then they like go to his face, and then they go to like Jerry running. And they go back to the fucking tentacle around his leg, and it's all bloody. And then they show him screaming. And like, back to his like, face, back to Jerry, yeah, like, back to the creature, back to his yeah, face, they, back to the creature, back to Jerry. It's like they it's drag over. it out for so long. I was just like, yeah. wow. Yeah, you're right. I don't see that in movies anymore. <laughs> but they we're doing it to build the tension. Yeah. Yes. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. It worked, man. It was a little tense, and I was a little bit worried about. Uh, Darwich. It was, but it started to border on being comedic after it went on for like a couple oh, yeah, seconds yeah, too yeah. long. Yeah. You're kind of waiting for the <laughs> Benny Hill theme to come in, you know? Yeah, exactly. Is this just what the movie is now? Is this going to keep happening? <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's a funny observation. Uh, what else you got, man? Uh, I mentioned it before, but I'll go back to it. The whole, the whole football the whole football thing. Oh, you really like that football bit. Yeah. The football bit was funny because it was like, usually you don't get to eat it. (laughs) 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 When you're done. I'll give you that. Yeah. All right. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. Which I think should become a thing. You know, I think the the football, I think if the football was edible, then football in general would be more believable, you know? Yeah. Like if it was just delicious, then you would believe. Then it would make sense for like you know the whole a thing. bunch of guys to be chasing it around and tackling each other over, right? <laughs> and patting each other's butts. Let's not forget that. Yeah, well, you know right. that's what you do when you're salivating over delicious football. Oh man, <laughs> <laughs> I like what you did there. Very nice. <laughs> yeah. Oh, good God! Um, While you're getting to knife and. Yeah. Oh, how's that Ginsu working out for you, by the way? It's uh it's, as advertised. <laughs> it's a you know, it's a carving knife. <laughs> <laughs> Not anything particularly special about it, yeah, but you know, it's a Ginsu. It says Ginsu on it, and that's dope. And that's all that matters. 
Yeah. It really it's more of an ornament for your kitchen so people know it's it's what's, a thing what's you up. can yeah. yeah. Exactly. Yeah. It's a it's an ornament, it's a it's a threat, you know, you know like you watch what you're saying here, I'll pull out my Ginsu knife. And they think you're bluffing and then you pull your Ginsu knife out and they're like, Holy shit, dude. Oh, whoa, this guy's legit. <laughs> that is a legit Ginsu knife. <laughs> you're not legit. getting it. Legit Ginsu, <laughs> man. Totally. Uh that is cool, man. All right. Uh, all right, I'm gonna before we transition into deaths and ratings, I'll just throw in the one nugget that I have. Uh, this is one I one that I caught that caught my eye, uh, and it's about because you know immediately when we brought up this movie, you and I started going <laughs> doing the whole uh, you know. Uh, uh, yes, garbage. thank yep. you, dude. Very good, by the way. Uh, so Gossett Jr. has said uh, in in a television interview that. He, he, you know, talked while gargling his own saliva, like as a kid. It was like one of these like dumb kid things that you do, right? So he told the yeah. director about it and he said he thought that it would add a nice touch to the character. And so he allowed it. And that's where the whole thing came from, man. Yeah. And he's the only one that does it. And he does uh, do it when he does uh, uh, conventions. And that's it. I think that's pretty cool. That is cool. Well, that's not how I do it. No, it's not how I do it either, man. I am, I'm, I'm sure saliva is a lubricating thing, but yeah, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> so it's more like, like uh, you know, vibrating the punching bag thing in the back yes. of your throat, sort of. Yeah, hundred <laughs> percent. Yeah, the punching bag thing <laughs> that Bugs Bunny or Popeye would hit. Yep, I know totally. exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> Or possibly Ren and Stimpy, yeah. Poss- definitely Ren and Stimpy. Right? No doubt. Oh. I, uh, oh, oh, deaths. Uh, we only got three deaths this week. Not a huge surprise. There's only two of us. Uh, yeah. you, you had get the tooth, wait, get out your toothbrush death from the beginning, mm-hmm. which is, uh, I love. Uh, then I ejected on ILM and then you ejected on Iron Eagle. That's about it. Yeah. Ratings. Ratings. Uh, I'm going to go with, uh, I'm going to give this a nine and a half. Yeah. I like it, man. I, I'm also going to go similar, uh, with a nine point, uh, I'll go 9.37 on this. Very good. Yeah. I mean, this is a stalwart classic, Ben. Uh, and I think that it still holds up and I was, uh, not terribly surprised to see that it held up. I, but I was glad that it did. And, um, any science fiction fan should watch this movie, period. That's oh, great. It's good science fiction, you know, decent effects, great makeup, mm. cool sets, you know, like cool world building. Definitely. And it's, but it's got, you know, it's got a lot more heart than uh, you're probably used to seeing in sci-fi flicks. So Definitely. Yeah. So go see it if you haven't seen it. Yeah. Criminally underrated. Yeah. Criminally underrated, dude. It doesn't even really hold a great score on Rotten Tomatoes. I'm really surprised after all these years too, you know, that somebody's yeah. some people aren't recognizing it. You know, you you can kind of tell that people either get it or they don't. You know, it, to be fair, it took me a little while to get it, but I was a kid, so it would probably be different if I was an adult. I don't know. Yeah, absolutely. So there you have it, folks. Enemy Mine. and uh, Chaz not here to tell us what we're going to do next week, so uh, we're not doing anything. And that's it. Uh, So thanks for tuning in for Enemy Mine. Uh, We'll see you next week for whatever we're going to see you for. We may leave it a mystery. And uh, that's it. We'll see you uh, you next time, folks. Doodles. And that's going to wrap up this week's episode. Folks, if you'd like to check out the show notes for this episode, you can do so in your podcast app of choice or at our website, ebd.fm forward slash episodes forward slash 228. Uh, if you'd like to support the show, uh, there's a number of great ways you can do so. Folks, you can tell friends to check out the show. You can uh, rate us. You can review us. You can also support us directly on Patreon. We appreciate all of those things, and we appreciate uh, people that have done it uh, to date. So thank you. And as always, you can check us out on social, uh, on Instagram, at EBD Podcasts, uh, where there's usually some little, you know, bits and bobs worth of chatting going on. And uh, yeah, so come along and join us. 
And we'll see you next week for whatever show that ends up being. Thanks for joining us for Enemy Mind. So long for now, folks. Stop and do it. Grab your mitt.